Hi, I'm Thomas Sherrill. We are just weeks away from the midterm elections and for many in Maryland, all eyes are on the governor's race. In the next half hour, you will hear individually from both the Democratic nominee for Governor Wes Moore and the Republican nominee, Dan Cox. Now, we should tell you that Fox 5 had originally invited both candidates to appear jointly in what would have been a Fox 5 debate. Dan Cox accepted our invitation to participate. Wes Moore did not respond by the deadline we had set. Later, his campaign announced that he would not participate in a Fox 5 debate. As a result of Wes Moore not agreeing to a face-to-face -face debate on Fox 5, it was decided to move ahead with this separated format after both campaigns agreed to participate. In this Fox 5 special Maryland gubernatorial forum, each candidate will be asked the same questions. Some we crafted here at Fox 5, others were from the general public. Each candidate was given one full minute for a response, so let's get to it. Here's our first question. Maryland residents have expressed ongoing concerns about violent crime, from carjackings to robberies and shootings. What would you do to support police departments and reduce violent crime? Yeah, this is an incredibly important issue for all Maryland families, uh, and, it's, and we're seeing it all throughout the state, in rural, urban, and suburban parts of the state. And it's the reason that I know we have to move in partnership in order to address it. Where uh, I'm proud to have received the support and the endorsement from from, the, from our police officers, and I know we're going to work in coordination with our communities to be able to address things like fixing a broken parole and probation system that will keep that will get and keep violent offenders off of our streets. It means we are going to do things like put additional resources to our local jurisdictions and take state resources and put them on loan to be able to address the the the, the low closure rate that we have for violent crimes that we see in the state of Maryland, and it means we are going to deal with the other challenging holistic issues and also some of the the bigger challenges we're seeing when it comes to the root causes of crime that we are not yet addressing education housing and economic growth and development we have to do those things in order to have a true platform on public safety maryland is desperate for leadership to make sure our streets are safe again i intend as your governor to bring back the policing that we need with support for all of our blue officers making sure that they know that we always have their backs, that we will not defund them like my opponent has pledged to do. He wants to take money out of the police budget, put it into the social welfare budget, and send social workers to violent crime sites. That's not how we operate our policing. We need to make sure our streets are safe through increasing our budget, fund our police, put our officers back on the streets. We're 1,200 officers down in Baltimore City. We need to rehire those officers and once again bring safety back to Maryland. That's a start and we're going to get it done. All right, let's get to our next question. With student test scores dropping in Maryland and school districts struggling to recruit and retain teachers, what do you think is the biggest priority facing Maryland schools right now? And what is your plan to address it? The biggest priority that we have is to ensure that the dollars reach the classroom, that the children actually get a world-class education. The problem that we're seeing instead is that we're eliminating and lowering school choice options for parents in the uh, areas of the state that need education options the most. I will expand the boost program and expand school choice. My opponent stands in opposition to that. Additionally, I will eliminate this divisive curriculum and teaching gender identity politics pre-K on up. This is not the path forward, but my opponent wants to do this behind parents' backs, and if parents object, they're the ones that start uh, that have to go through an investigation. That will not happen on my watch. I will end that and get, get us back in Maryland to a world-class education, making sure the money goes to the schools, making sure that we have our HVAC systems working in Baltimore City, and once again, ensuring that those in the classroom get the Article 8 constitutional due process they need with an education that's world-class. Yeah, there, there's no priority that is, uh, that is of a higher measure than making sure that we have a 21st century education system for all of our children. I think about what saved me was uh, I had a mother who wouldn't quit and I had an education that taught me that the world was bigger than what was just directly in front of me. And so that means there's certain things that we've got to focus on, like making sure we're starting earlier and having pre-K for every single child in need in the state of Maryland. It means creating better pipeways and, and pathways to be able to both recruit and retain educators 
into our classrooms, top quality educators. And it also means that we have to have full accountability measurements when it comes to our educational growth for all of our students. I, I was very proud to work on the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, which was a groundbreaking piece of Maryland legislation. I'm very proud that in our administration, uh, we're gonna work with our educators, and I was very proud to receive the endorsement of Maryland's educators. And we're gonna work in partnership with our parents to create a world-class platform for all of our children. All right, let's hear from our public now. Our next question comes from Cindy in Tacoma Park. Take a listen. Yes, I wonder how the governors feel about protecting trans youth rights. Thank you so much for the question, Cindy. And, uh, and this is an incredibly important question because there's a certain statistic that, um, that sits heavily with me. 80% uh, of trans individuals have contemplated suicide. This is a group who oftentimes does not feel seen and does not feel heard. And I think about with my own child. Uh, I have an 11-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. The only thing I want for my child is for them to be comfortable in their own skin, is for them to feel protected everywhere they go. And I have the same expectation for every child in the state of Maryland. And that's what we want for every child in the state of Maryland. So to all of our, our, our trans youth out there, I see you and I hear you and I'm excited to be your governor too. We are a smart and compassionate people and we protect everyone's rights. That's what I tell my students and youth uh, and on those that I speak with on the campaign trail that this is one of the few nations on earth where you can literally sue your government for civil rights violations. That's an amazing thing. Why do we do that? We do that because we believe in the Imago Dei, that we are made in the image of God. We have rights that are unalienable, can't take them away, and those rights need to be defended. Now, the issue before us right now in the schools is more uh, along the lines of ensuring we do not indoctrinate our children with this gender ideology from pre-K on up. That's what's going on. That has nothing to do with protecting rights. That in instead is an agenda that no parent embraces. And I intend to remove that from the schools, which allows us to protect all of our students. All right, we're going to turn now to the economy. A recent Goucher College poll shows that two thirds of Marylanders say that they are experiencing financial hardships because of inflation. Also at the same time, Maryland has racked up a $2 billion surplus, 20% higher than expected. How should that money be spent? Maryland is hurting financially. We have the worst economic crisis in really my lifetime happening right in front of us. And it's only projected to get worse. And the tragedy that I see is that we have plenty of money in the budget right now and in the Treasury of Maryland. It was projected to be $7 billion, $7.5 billion. Then the fluid rate was $4.5. And now they're projecting well over $2 billion. Right now, the federal tax cuts should be coming back to Maryland small businesses, to our job creators, and to our employees. That's your money. I'm going to send it back to you. My opponent wants to spend it, wants to spend it on bigger government. That's not the approach that Maryland needs right now. We need to make sure that all of our families have the resources that we can uh, access, that's our tax dollars that we pay, to make sure that we have the jobs necessary, that our children have the future needed, and that our seniors are not taxed out of this state. I intend to get this done, and I'm asking for your support to do that. Yeah, the, the state of Maryland uh, does have a, a structural surplus that is in the billions, but I think the important thing to remember is this is not about how are we going to spend it. Uh, this is about how do we properly invest it. Invest it in a way that's gonna create the largest societal return on that investment. And the inflation issue, it is real. Uh, as I'm going all around the state of Maryland, I'm hearing people tell me, well, things just feel like they're more expensive. The answer is, it's because they are more expensive. And so we've got to focus on the basics. We've got to get people back to work. And that means uh, addressing job, uh, job reskilling and job retraining. It means we've got to fix broken childcare systems that exist in the state of Maryland. Uh, and it also means we need to increase wages. Because right now we have too many Marylanders who are working jobs, in some cases multiple jobs, and still living at or below the poverty line. We can create an economy that works for everybody. All right, we're just getting started. Coming up, we're talking the Washington Commanders, where the candidates think the next stadium should be. And the overturning of Roe v. Wade has created a wave of dialogue and protest across the country. Where do the two candidates for Maryland governors stand on that issue?
Welcome back to this Fox 5 special Maryland Governor's Forum. Our next question is about the Washington Commanders. The team currently plays in Landover, Maryland, but are reportedly looking to build a brand new stadium in either D.C., Maryland or Virginia. As governor, would you work to strike a deal to keep the commanders in Maryland, despite owner Daniel Snyder being investigated by both Congress and the NFL? I, I want the commanders to uh, to stay in Maryland. It's also a, a very deep personal family issue because we have I have family members who have been long time commanders friends, uh, and at the risk of making Thanksgiving very uncomfortable, I also know this. We cannot mortgage the future of Maryland for the commanders if we're not also talking about economic growth and development around the stadium. That has got to be a prerequisite when we're talking about what becomes the future for the commanders in the state. That it's not just about a football team. This is about how are we using it as an anchor to create economic growth, economic development, and participatory economics in everything that we are doing. If we're doing that, then I would love to see the commanders have a long-term home here, um, but that has got to be a part of that conversation. Well, I certainly would like to look at all the options. Um, we would love to keep all of our sports teams and opportunities in Maryland to bring the revenue here, to bring you know, the opportunities for our people here in Maryland. Um, but I certainly would not want to weigh in on something without examining the issues, bringing the stakeholders to the table, making sure the stadium authority uh, provides the information that I need to review that, and having the most qualified people giving me that advice. I look forward to making sure that we expand our entertainment and our sports opportunities in Maryland. This is one of the things that I think that we can do better here. We're, we have the most beautiful uh, opportunities here in Maryland with the ocean, the bay, and the mountains, and yet our entertainment and sports industry is, is just not um, what it could be. And the way we move forward is we don't need to continue a process of increasing taxation on our businesses and chasing away our sports teams. So I, I look to bring more opportunities here and make sure that we do that in a, an appropriate manner. Our next candidate for the questions is the U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade this year. It's put the issue of abortion rights squarely in the hands of state governments. Pro-choice America lists Maryland as a state that has protected access to abortion. The question is, do you think the court was correct in overturning Roe v. Wade? As governor, what steps would you take as Maryland moves forward into a post-Roe future? Well, I'm pro-life and I always will be pro-life. I support our unborn children and then I, I, my wife and I are blessed with a special needs son who's seven months old, is precious. And so we will always support life. And I can say this, the Roe v. Wade decision is not impacting Maryland politics because it has returned power back to the people in the states. And Maryland um, you know, has a, a growing abortion tourism industry. That's not uh, what the future of Maryland wants. We don't want to spend our taxpayer dollars on that. People want money back in their pockets. So the issue in this election is more about empowering the people, putting money back in your pockets to make your choices, and not paying for things that, that really our taxpayer dollars shouldn't be paying for. That's the focus of Maryland, and that's what I intend to serve as your governor, to do and expand opportunities in health care for women, protecting all of our communities, and making sure that life is um, always upheld at every point in our state. I, I think the Supreme Court, uh, all they did was, uh, was rob millions of women uh, in this country uh, from health care. I believe that abortion is health care. Uh, and I believe and I know that in our time and in our administration, we will ensure that Maryland will be a safe haven for abortion rights. That this will be a place where we will respect that right of our women. Uh, and I do know that in this time, we have a unique opportunity to make that so where back in the fall I pushed for a constitutional amendment. Uh, as the state's next governor, I will push for it again, where I want to see Maryland be a true safe haven for abortion rights and knowing that abortion access is going to be respected in the state of Maryland. All right, still ahead on this Fox 5 gubernatorial forum, putting the brakes on traffic on 270. The candidates weigh in on how to revamp the improved major highway, plus a question from you. Hear the responses from both Dan Cox and Wes Moore on election integrity.
Welcome back to this Fox 5 gubernatorial forum. Our next question involves transportation. The federal government approved Governor Larry Hogan's plan to build express toll lanes on the traffic clogged I-270 and a new American Legion bridge. The next governor, though, will have the final say on the estimated $4 billion project. The question is this, do you support the approved current version of the plan to expand I-270 and the American Legion Bridge, and would the construction proceed under your administration? The issue of congestion is, is real, and we have to address it. Right now, congestion is causing a psychological and environmental and also an economic impact on our state. So we have to fix the American Legion Bridge over this next decade. It is unsafe. We have to address the issue of congestion on 270 the Beltway. Uh, but at the same time, while the current plan, as proposed, I have real issues with the current plan. And I have real issues because I think there are certain factors that are not factored into it, that we have to think differently and, and deeply about how do you have mass transit options in the way that we are pulling this together, that we have got to think about equity, both in who's building it and also who can benefit from it, that we have to think about the environment and we cannot have transportation projects that are having harmful impacts on the environment and we need local feedback and local input into the transportation decisions that we're making. So I do not believe in raising tolls and taxes. My administration will lower taxes and will ensure that all of our uh, tolls and, and fees and fines are looked at from a perspective of making sure that people in Maryland are not fleeced by our government. This is one of the focuses of my uh, work in Annapolis, to make sure that I'm putting money back in your pockets. And so when it comes to toll roads, I think we need to do what the Constitution says, and that is to allow the expansion of our transportation and of our roads without an, a continuation of a taxation to the people. So I will look to continue the construction, but I'm not supportive of tolling the people. This is wrong. So I, am, I will in, uh, work with the, uh, fact, you know, the, the actors, I will work with all the stakeholders, making sure that we bring everybody to the table to focus on expanding our construction. I will audit the Transportation Trust Fund, publish that information online, and make sure that our transportation tax dollars are going to expand our roads without increasing our taxation. All right, our next question comes now from Chuck in Frederick. Let's take a listen. I, I would ask them about the, uh, the integrity of the last election and facts related um, to the results. Election integrity is crucial because all parties and all of our citizens require a fair election with one vote, one person. And that's what I've been fighting for in the legislature. I've worked across the aisle to make that happen. And I've worked to make sure that audits are done, for instance, prior to the certification of an election, whenever there's a need for an audit, just like what happened here in Frederick uh, recently. So I believe that in the last election, to answer the question, there were significant concerns that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court just recently uh, ruled that the mail-in ballot system there was not constitutional. I don't know the end results of that. I'm certainly not an expert uh, in these areas, but I do uh, embrace and, and believe strongly in our election integrity system. I have served as an attorney to make that happen. I've served as a state delegate to make that happen. And I'm currently fighting for that right now to make sure that you have confidence in your vote. Thanks so much, Chuck. Uh, and, you know, I, I believe that the foundation of everything that we fight for is our democracy. Uh, I'm thankful for the fact that the state of Maryland uh, has had fair and transparent elections, and we will continue to have so. And, and I believe deeply that those election results need to be respected and honored. Uh, it's an important part of our nation's fabric. And so I, I honor and respect the results of the 2020 election. Uh, I, I look forward to honoring and respecting the results of the 2022 election. And I think it is a bare minimum is what we should, as, as people seeking to be elected officials and holding office, uh, that all of us should accept and understand those things. All right, coming up, you've seen them on the campaign trail, but what happens after the election? The question you asked and the answer from both candidates coming up.
Welcome back. We've got time for one last question brought to us by one of you. This one from Kerry in Hyattsville. We see you during election time. We see your signs. Will we see you after you get elected? Will you actually be active out in the community showing and doing what you promised? Oh, Kerry, thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, we have been all over the state for the past year and a half. And people were saying, you know, I'm seeing you a lot in our community. And my answer is get used to it because that's why I plan on governing. I have been a public servant for my whole life. I just haven't been a politician. And the thing that I know is the only way that I've done my work, it's not just in communities, it's with communities whether it's leading soldiers, whether it's running a successful small business, whether it was running one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country. I've been able to be successful because I've done my work in and with communities. And that's exactly how I plan on governing. Everything that we are going to do in our administration is going to be done in cooperation and coordination with our community. So you're gonna see a lot of me. Well, Carrie in Hyattsville, I just am thrilled to hear that you have seen me out in Hyattsville because we have been there multiple times. And I'm also thrilled that you would like us to continue that relationship because that's my heart, that's my focus, and that's my pledge. I am actually from the Hyattsville area. That's where I started my life. My father is a minister, and uh, we began in a little place called Hamilton Gardens. And then we moved to Frederick um, about four, four years after that. So I believe in making sure all of our communities have the voice that they need in the state house in Annapolis. That's why I'm a state delegate. That's why I've been fighting down there for your voices to be heard. And that's why I'm running for governor. I'm tired of the special interests and the international lobbyists clouding out your voices and taking over our freedoms. We need to make sure that you have access to your freedom, to your knowledge of information, and that you have a voice at the table in Annapolis. I intend to make that happen. All right, and that's going to do it for this Fox 5 special Maryland gubernatorial forum. For more information on the election and the candidates, including their responses to questions on juvenile curfews, school resource officers, and low-income housing, head on over to our website at fox5dc.com slash election. A reminder, Election Day in Maryland is Tuesday, November 8th. The Maryland early voting period runs from Thursday, October 27th through Thursday, November 3rd. You can join Fox 5 on election night as we bring you live coverage of all the races in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. I'm Tom Fitzgerald. For all of us here at Fox 5, thanks for joining us.